We're going to begin here today with the background and really this almost white, bright, warm pigment. I'm going to start with a one inch flat headed brush because it's great for blocking in larger backgrounds and I'll dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water which will condense the bristles but also make blending a little bit easier. So I'm going to start by grabbing quite a lot of titanium white, moving that to a clean spot on my palette. I'll grab maybe one tenth that in Naples yellow and similar amount with our burnt sienna. This will give us a warm white essentially and we'll start heading in to the larger areas where we'll see the sky through our foliage. I'm just looking up at my reference photo that way I have a good idea of where it's going to be and of course we're going to need to do this bottom area. Now we'll start working on those reflections of that warm light that we have on the top, starting with this larger opening right here, but towards the left, we also have a fairly large opening. I tend to make these applications slightly larger than they should be, that way we can overlap them a little bit later with our foliage, and it'll just make everything look a whole lot more natural towards the end. I'm also going to go back up towards the top and go over some of the previously applied areas if I feel like it doesn't have enough paint or if it just looks a little bit too thin. As we move back up, we can also start establishing some smaller little openings. We have these larger clusters in different shapes and sizes, but we're also going to want tiny ones as well. And I'm just using the corner of my brush because it gives me a nice, sharp, intentional application, despite the fact that it is a larger brush. And while I'm here, I'll go over previous applications yet again, make sure they're nice and thick that I don't have too much of my drawing showing through. So here we have a wider shot, and as you can see, our applications aren't that distinct from the brighter background. We do want this to be a subtle change from that white. We just want it to be a little bit warmer. And again, we're looking for the larger openings with the occasional small little piece as well, which we can re-interject later should we need to. But let's head back to the reference photo and start working on some foliage. Now, this sun-soaked foliage is exactly what we want. We can see that it expands all the way up to the top, to the left. It surrounds this nice opening here, and we are still going to be using the one-inch flat-headed brush. I want quite a bit of titanium white. You can even mix in here if you'd like, but we want about half that in our yellow ochre and half that in our burnt sienna. So. We'll mix these together, and this should render something quite a bit warmer and quite a bit more saturated than what we were previously working with. However, we do want to make it slightly less saturated. A very easy way of going about that is adding some Mars Black. It will also darken it, which is something I'd like to do in a minor amount. I'm not grabbing much Mars Black, and I'm taking off the excess. It can be very dominant in the mix. So with that, let's go and do a little test. Tap it in a couple of different areas, just make sure it's working. And I think it could use slightly more burnt sienna. We try not to go with the very first color we mix because often it can be improved. And I think this will do it. Brilliant. Okay, so let's head back to the canvas. Now, we do need quite a bit of this pigment because we are going to apply it in great abundance. I'm going to begin here towards the center of the painting, as again, we do need to surround this nice opening that's going to happen on both the bottom and the top. However, we can start blending into it now, or we can wait a little bit later, depending on if the initial mixture here is still wet. If it's not wet, 
just trying to get a bit of a soft edge rather than something harsh as it'll be easier to do a wet and a dry blend in a later step but if it's still wet you can do a proper blend. Right now it's going to look a little messy but that's okay. When I get up towards an opening in my foliage and that again is easily dictated by where we previously painted the lighter pigments we can just go in with a bit of a tap like so and that gives us the impression that there's an opening in the foliage. We are going to be covering a lot of the trees to the left and the right hand side through this process and redrawing them on a little bit later. Don't worry about that. It will make your life easier if you do in fact cover them up for the most part. And again, we want sporadic openings, purposefully painting with you quite a bit farther away here, just so you can get a grasp of just how large our movements are right now. And so that you can see that it's going to look a little bit awkward for a period of time. It's normally how acrylic painting works, as it's a very layer-based medium. We're always building things up to make them look a little bit better. And in between those builds, we can get something that looks a little bit silly. So, don't get discouraged. If it starts off looking messy, mine is looking messy as well. That is A-OK. -okay. It's all part of the process. With that, we are continuing to move around. I'm just looking up at the reference photo, trying to get a diverse set of taps in here, lots of little openings within the taps. Just like that, builds back towards this larger area. There's a tree in the middle here, which you can cover if you want to. I'm going to go over the edges of it. And then we slowly move into a larger block yet again, which can have some slight openings. And as we get towards the bottom, we leave quite a large area open. If you cover up more than you want, and you want some of this light shining through a little bit later, that's easy to work in. So don't worry about overdoing it. There we go. With that, we do still need our reflections and I am going to go over this a couple of times to A, take out some of the streaks and B, just ensure we have a nice thick finish Once we have this all on, we can get to some of the blending. That said, let's first finish up this bottom area by just working this towards the larger set of trees on the right hand side. And to mirror what we have over here down in this spot. Not too tricky. We've done it once, we can do it again. And then there's an opening in this tree as well. Now, well, initially I thought we'd blend this into this through a wet into dry technique. I can tell that the yellow is still quite wet and this is still a little bit wet thanks to us consistently dipping our brush in a little bit of water. So I'm going to show you how we can go back and get a clean blend between the two using a wet into wet technique. So we'll just grab a bit more of this yellow, make sure that we have a good amount around our edge right here, make sure that we have a good amount around this edge 
right up here. Then I'll take as much of that pigment off my brush as possible by dipping my brush in some water. We'll come back and remix this very, very quickly, taking some titanium white, a little bit of that yellow ochre, just like so. And then I'm going to reapply this in the middle of both and softly with my brush I'm just going to work the white or the warm white out into the yellow and the yellow in towards the warm light and I'm just going over it a couple of times trying not to press hard press hard with my brush because if I do I'm going to get a much sharper application, but I'm also, unfortunately, going to get a very streaky application, and that's not what we want. So, we'll just grab more titanium white, and I'm not even going to grab the yellow ochre this time because my brush has so much of this on it that it's just not necessary. Here we go. Again, softly, bringing that yellow in, and bringing that warm white out. Trying not to bring it too far into the center though. There we go. And the more we can make this gradient dominant, the better it's going to look. Here you can see that because this top area started drying, it didn't accept that brighter pigment the way we wanted. So we'll go back, we'll grab more of this, apply it towards that top. There we go. Obviously, this is a lot larger, so we'll need to make the top warmer white larger to match it. Maybe even a little bit brighter, just because reflections are typically slightly darker than what they are projecting. Again, soft with my brush. I'm working relatively quickly, but I'm still being very controlled with my applications. And this is something you might have to do a couple of times before you get it right, but it's okay. We're working with acrylics, and if it doesn't work out perfectly, just let it dry. Come back in five or 10 minutes, and you'll be able to try again like it's brand new. And you can see that it's not a quick process for me either. Lots of reworking. We'll have a lot of branches and foliage covering up a lot of this, so it's okay if it's not absolutely perfect from the beginning either, and you can cover up areas that you don't love. But, it's always nice to have it working from an earlier part of the painting process, just because I think it inspires self-confidence. There we go. So here we have it from a real distance, and it is important to take those steps back away from the painting as they'll let you see everything working together, and we can ensure that it's cohesive, rather than getting hyper fixated on an individual area and trying to make that look great while not balancing the painting. With that, we are now going to switch to a liner brush. Now, these are great for achieving real detail and we'll be using it for a lot of our edging with the foliage in the background. Though, as per usual, we're going to dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water as that will help us with condensing the bristles and getting a sharper, more definitive marking. Now, as we can see in the reference photo, all of these little openings are quite defined in terms of detail, where those edges have almost individual leaves showing. More so clusters, but you definitely want to paint it as if it is individual leaves, and ours right now looks incredibly rough. We painted this with a much larger brush, which simply wasn't able to achieve the detail level that we wanted, but this will let us get there. So with that, I'm going to put my phone down, dip my brush in a little bit of water, 
grab some of that nice warmer pigment that we have here in the middle and this will allow us to create openings and sharpen the edges here so that it looks like we have individual little leaves and clusters of them. I'm also going to separate portions just like this because the branches will be far away to the point where we can't really distinguish them. So we'll just see the variance in colors. Now here, we're still creating those openings. Let's do some over here. And it's almost like painting little abstract shapes. Typically, the more time we put into this, the better it will look. There we go. It's one of those things where if you overdo it, we can also paint in this warmer background on top. So you can overdo it and then work your way backwards, which is typically how I personally love to paint. That way I have seen the painting when it has too little paint. I've seen the painting when it has too much paint and therefore I can distinguish that proper middle mark. And I'm never just sitting with the painting wondering, well, what if we did more? What if we had less, you know? We have that answer through the process. So here, we're just painting in a lot of those little taps. Again, it will look quite abstract initially here, but as we continue to define other areas and add future layers of foliage, which will be a bit darker and have more form, it'll make more sense. Also, as I get higher up in the trees, Realistically, we're getting closer to us, the audience. So, we make our markings a bit larger as perspective. We'll make it all appear that way, right? These look farther away, so they're smaller, or they are farther away, so they look smaller, rather. And it's important to think about these things as we go through the painting process, not just how to paint what we're painting, but also why we paint it that way. That way we can take these ideas and we can bring them into future paintings as well. It's always the goal, not to just teach a single lesson, but to equip you with knowledge for your own future renditions. There we go. Starting to make sense. Trying to diversify my applications quite dramatically. That way they're not always going in the same direction. There we are. Now as we step back, things are starting to make a bit more sense visually. And we have quite a bit of other areas to accomplish predominantly over here on the left hand side, though we probably have the hang of it. So this next portion should go by a bit more quickly. Though, again, nothing wrong with taking your time in the painting process. Don't feel like you have to keep up with what I'm doing here. You're more than welcome to rewind or even watch the lesson before you start the painting process. That way you have a real idea of what we're going to do here today. But with that, I'm creating these smaller openings, sometimes sporadic, sometimes in clusters, really trying to switch it up and create that diversity because that really is what makes paintings look natural, especially of nature. And we'll come down here and do something similar. Again, you can see I'm working more quickly. You can also hold your brush farther back. This will relinquish some level of control and make it harder to make distinctive markings, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually great when rendering foliage or anything in nature that you do need to diversify because typically if we hold it like a pencil, we develop habits quickly and a lot of our strokes and applications look very similar to the ones next to 
what we're doing. So this is just a great way of ensuring that we don't accidentally form those patterns and hinder the painting. You can see that I'm also kind of jumping around now that we have a bit of a wider look and I really like how that worked out. That said, I do want more foliage. So we grab our Naples yellow, equal amount of our burnt sienna, good amount of titanium white, and this brush admittedly isn't great for blending and mixing because it just doesn't have many bristles. That's one of the reasons why the one inch flathead is so great in the beginning, but this can get the job done. So we've remixed that and we can go back in and further add individual little pieces in a way that we couldn't when we were working with the one inch. And here you can see I have an opening, but this extends out. Here we have an opening, and this kind of has a round wrapping area. And much like we were previously, I'm going to jump around area to area, look at the piece as a larger hole, and continue to ask myself, where would this paint look best? Right? Also, again, looking at the reference photo quite a lot, which, as per usual, I will have up over on Patreon, along with the reference photo. There we go. Really like that. Let's head down to the bottom because we do have to work on that reflection. Now, typically, when I like to do reflections, I try to keep the area that it's reflecting in my sight line. So here in the viewfinder, you can see both the top and the bottom. That way we can kind of compare and contrast. I see that's a notable marking. I'm going to try to copy that. And then we'll go in with our normal applications. In a scenario like this, copying it perfectly will take quite a large amount of time. I'm going to go for something that mirrors it to a good extent. It's not going to be perfect, though you can make it perfect. Also, if your water is running at all, you can incorporate more movement and more changes. It doesn't have to be a perfect reflection. It's all dependent upon the setting of the painting, the reference photo, or not the reference photo if you want to take some artistic liberties. I want a little bit of movement in the water, but not much. So I'm going to give everything a slight soft blend, unlike up here where you have those sharper edges. Here I'm just going to make things look a little bit softer. And that way it doesn't look incorrect not being a perfect recreation. But again, we want the distinguishable, notable pieces to be the same, and we want the same general movements as well. And you can see that frequently I'm going up in the painting to find very specific spots to mirror. And we can cover up previous portions, jumping back and forth. And it's best to look at this not as a tree, but as individual little shapes and patterns. That's going to get you the best results. So again, we're covering up a lot of this with additional foliage, branches, all of that good stuff. So don't feel like you need to spend too much time. That said, on to the next step. Now we'll get quite close to those openings and still using our liner brush, we're going to grab the yellow that we used for the outskirts and we'll start painting in some individual branches of trees. Now we're going to want to do this on both the top and the bottom. It'd be a lot easier if we do them together right now. Just like that. And you essentially want it to fade off into 
our previous applications. So here's another one. If your brush is quite a bit more watery than normal, that can actually be really useful here because it'll show the previous pigment through it. It'll look more semi-transparent and it'll just blend well. There we go. I'm layering quite a number of them. You don't want them to essentially all look like they are starting from the same place. You want them to kind of intertwine a little bit and that's going to make it look a lot more natural. And we want small branches to come out of the pre-existing ones. There we go. We need to mirror that at the bottom. And here is a part where we are taking our time, just making sure we make it look nice and intentional. Here we do want more structure than what we had with the openings in the foliage, that's for sure. And I'm pressing very lightly with my brush because when you apply a lot of pressure with your brush, you create larger strokes. And that is not what we are trying to do here. We want smaller ones because these trees are in the distance and we don't want too much going on there. Start working from a little bit farther away just so we have that wider perspective. So here we are, a little bit farther away. We do want to do this to the other side, but I'm not going to do it to such a dramatic extent. We do want that draping effect to a point, but I don't want it to become too busy. So that is something I'm trying to keep in mind throughout this process. And we are really just looking for the right balance. You can see I'm going over a number of these applications a couple of times because I am using a fair amount of water and when we do that we really dilute our pigments. Sometimes they just don't really show up. And that's okay. It means we're being very safe with our applications. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to consider through this process. Here now I'm playing more so with the smaller branches which connect and just trying to keep them all unique while properly mirrored. We can also grab this brighter pigment, move it to the middle, grab the darker pigment, make a healthy mix of the two, and we can paint on some highlights to trees here on the right hand side. And I say on the right hand side because the light isn't actually coming from this middle area. It's coming from the left hand side, but it's a bit farther down and it's just illuminating that space because it's so open. So we want to, when we paint our trees, to have the light predominantly on the left hand side of each individual tree. And that means over here, we're going to have that semi-prominent. There we go. So a lot of that wraparound is actually happening with this pigment, not the other. Now, as we continue to move forward in the painting, we're going to start working on this slightly darker foliage that we can see kind of throughout the piece. We don't want to go to the true darks just yet, as this foliage is more of the middle ground where that's more of the foreground. And for this, we already are on the right track. It's similar to this mixture, but a little bit darker and a little bit more of our burnt sienna is interjected. So let's take our burnt sienna. And previously, with this mixture, it was about half and a half burnt sienna and yellow ochre. So we're only going to go with half that yellow ochre from the initial mixture. And 
Then of course we need quite a bit of our titanium white, probably an equal mixture to that of the yellow ochre for what we're doing right now. And we need to desaturate it, darken it, so we'll head over to our Mars Black. We don't want that much, so I'm taking off the excess. Again, I, I like the idea of one-tenth for our first interjection of Mars Black. Really keeping it safe, and as you can see, that's far brighter than what we need. So we'll double up on that Mars Black, and we'll slowly continue to increase it until we have something that looks akin to the middle ground here. And I have a see-through palette, so really convenient in these scenarios. We can kind of just paint that on. We can see it's still not dark enough. So yet again, doubling up on that Mars black, getting a fairly good mix so that some areas aren't orange while others, oh wow, that's great. It's really close value-wise. I think it needs to be a bit warmer. So burnt sienna. That looks wonderful. Okay, very happy. So we'll take this pigment and we'll head over to the canvas. So yet again, approaching this from a bit of a distance because we do want to see the larger scale of everything. And I know that I need to start over here because it's a definitive area that's going to give me a lot of information. And you can already tell just how much darker this looks in relation to everything else that we have on the canvas. It's definitely distinct. It's going to give us an additional level of depth. I'm trying to be fairly careful with my applications in that I want them all to be nice and opaque. I'm trying to ensure that these applications are thick enough that they look professional. It can be easy to just kind of continue tapping on this paint until you really don't have anything. And then you have semi-transparent, seemingly unfinished layers. And if you find you accidentally are in that spot with an area, just let it dry and then go back over it again with more pigment. But from the beginning here, I'm trying to be mindful and ensure that my applications are intentional. Again, diverse and somewhat randomized, but the way in which the paint is applied is intentional. And here I'm just looking up at the reference photo. I can see that this has a bit of an arch like that, despite the fact that it has little openings throughout. There we go. Then we have another one right down here. And this is kind of just floating off. We will paint branches in relatively soon, but right now we are just focusing on our foliage. And then we have one that's underneath. Again, looking at it all as abstract shape rather than a tree, a cluster of foliage, anything like that, because it'll just end up translating a lot better from the photo. The same goes for real life. Typically looking at a subject and saying, okay, this is a, this is a mountain. I'm going to paint it like a mountain. That's going to give you something that looks a little bit more cartoony than what you actually want, because we all have these pre-established ideas of what subjects are, what they look like. That goes for people, goes for animals, trees, really just about everything. And a lot of these ideas that we have are formed when we're quite young, when we are still watching cartoons and therefore a lot of our ideas of what these look like inherently in our head are simplified. So when we just go in to paint a tree, we end up painting something that looks at much more like a, a simplified tree than a, a true tree. So that's why we're just looking for shapes here. That said, there is an architectural element down at the bottom of the painting, which I don't love. Typically I, I love painting architecture, but I just don't feel like this fits well. 
So I'm going to take some artistic liberties towards the bottom here. We'll probably play with some additional branches. And remember, whatever changes we make here, we'll have to make in the reflection. With that, let's get you a little bit closer for a lot of the detail work within this. Now we also want to do some of it in between the trees. And what I want to paint right now is a little bit farther back. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take some of this pigment, move it off on the palette, grab some extra water, thin out this pigment so that when I apply it, it's more transparent and therefore it'll have less of a stark value. And that less stark value will make it look like it's farther away, like more light is able to work around and through it. So it's an easy way of establishing depth by just making your pigment here a little bit more transparent. You don't even have to make it brighter in the mix. You just change the way the paint comes together with water. Again, leaving nice little openings. This is quite far away, so we're probably not going to see a massive amount of detail, so I'll actually start combining areas to make it look more like clusters and individual leaves. There we go. Like that. We'll do a complementary area right up here using this very watery mixture. It's going to start making this all look a whole lot more natural, especially from a distance. Here, ran out of paint, so we get more, we get more water. It's a dance back and forth. And we just want to vary the values here. And the values, again, just regarding how dark or light a subject is. There we go. Now, we'll grab more of this, and we're going to start moving towards us, more towards that middle ground as we move up here. So, making my strokes a bit larger, there's more paint, and you can really see the difference between a watery mix and a mix that still has a little bit of water because the brush is damp, but significantly less so than what it was down here. And the variance, especially when farther back, is going to really work in our favor in building depth. You can also build transitions between them where they kind of create a gradient, and not a soft gradient, but a, a textured one, one of pattern. And then we need to come up here, but I'm starting to run out of paint and you can see that in my markings. They don't look distinct, they look messy. That's not what we want. So we grab some extra paint, come back, fill those in, that looks so much better already. Having those distinct markings, incredibly big difference. Now some of this we will go back and darken maybe even add a bit of green into a little bit later. I know it's strange, we're painting foliage leaves and we are yet to dive into any green, but when an area is so sun-soaked, you don't really see the inherent natural color of the leaves. You see that extremely warm light reflecting on them. That's also why it's important to learn from nature, learn from photos, because I think a lot of us would inherently have said, oh, you know, we looked at the reference photo, those are probably greens, but you take them into something like Photoshop and you look at what color it actually is and they're warm browns, oranges. It's a lot going on there. Here, I want more of a transition, so watery. There we go. I'm going to start holding my brush from farther back. 
We're going to be putting a lot of branches over this, by the way. So don't worry too, too much about this area or this area in the middle, but we can tap in some now as essentially placeholders. And let's get a little bit of a look from a distance just to ensure that we're not kind of overdoing or underdoing a certain area. From a distance, it is starting to come along nicely, but it is very apparent that the top needs work. So I'm going to start in one of the more distinct areas, which is the top left hand corner. And we are going to be overlapping quite a bit of the brighter orange background in this trying to rotate my brush as I go through these painting motions. That way we have different directions for the leaves rather than them kind of becoming predictable. Go over the middle portions a couple of times to build them up and make them a bit more thick. And this is going to extend over towards the center where things are going to get quite thick. We're going to have, again, a bit more of that arching feel with this. And I think it'll actually turn into something really nice quite soon. We'll create a second one right down here, being a bit more loose with my stroke, not because these are my final strokes, but because I can see in the photo how I want this compositionally to work. And I'm almost just sketching it in with watery paint fully intending to go back and fix these areas, give them more definitive shape, form, and a lot of opaque pigment. So still using water, but using more paint than water. In relation, it's working quite well. Now you can see these openings not only in the backing layer, but in the mid-ground layer as well. Really like how this is coming along. There we go. The foreground is going to have a lot of foliage up here, but we can get that area started and almost use this as a testing portion. And I'm going to kind of do a slight vignette, essentially, via textured applications over here on the right hand side. The eye innately goes to the brightest point of any piece. So by keeping the middle of our painting, the brightest will keep the eye towards the center rather than having it veer off of the canvas and losing the viewer's attention. Now we will mirror quite a lot of those steps towards the bottom and remember this area very watery so going back grabbing more and we begin this process by looking for the most distinct markings. I like to move my hand up back and forth and looks like we have some right there. I'm trying to do a bit more of a blend in the bottom so that we can apply slight movement. Something else you can do is actually turn your canvas upside down and some people find that helps with painting reflections. I find when you no longer look at it as a subject though, as trees, it gets a lot easier to just paint those shapes upside down naturally without going through that extra step. I'm going to just darken a little bit of that middle area. Remember that reflections are normally a little bit darker anyway, so it isn't necessarily a bad thing. And we create more of a vignette if this bottom area is darker because it'll keep the eye towards the middle of the painting. There we go. We don't actually need too much over on that side, but we do need quite a bit more over here. And we will need to thicken it. There we 
we go. Just like that. It leads up into another area. This will lead up into another area. We can even go up and play with this a little bit. Really enjoy doing reflections. I think it's one of those things that makes so many paintings look really special. And I feel like often people feel a little bit intimidated by them initially, by the idea of going ahead and doing so, but I do think it's definitely worth the time and effort. Also, down here, I'm going to do something similar and we're essentially going to the land and the reflection of the land it gets darker towards the middle often by the way foliage clusters of it the center area is going to be the most opaque the darkest the edges are going to get a little bit more semi-transparent a little bit brighter when an image is backlit like this because or left to the left and backlit um just because that center area has a lot more foliage and it's just more for the light to work through and the light can't always do so efficiently so in a lot of scenarios we end up having the middle area darker because the light can't work its way through, but the edges, the light can wrap around all of those smaller individual pieces of foliage with significantly more ease. There we go. Remember we have that motion. So we're recreating it down here. And before I'm going in with the really darker pigments. We kind of just ensure that we have all of the right shapes and placements beforehand. There we go. And we'll just clean that all up. Looking good. Definitely need thicker paint. And when we have thin paint, by the way, it's a great opportunity to work over here because we have all of those very thin applications towards the top. So here we are going in with some water. I'll just work that down a little bit. Now, before we actually start painting the trees and all of the branches, we're going to start working on the foreground foliage, which is quite a bit darker and a little bit more green as it is closer to us. And again, as things do present themselves to be closer, you lose that atmospheric reflective light and you get more of that innate coloring. So how do we get it to be a little bit more green with the colors we currently have on our palette? We use more yellow ochre. Why? Because yellow ochre and Mars black typically render a bit more of a green pigment. So we'll start with the yellow ochre. We'll grab about maybe one fifth that Mars black. Remember we want this to be quite dark. And here in relation you can see just how green that is. Though we do want it to be a bit warmer. So we will grab maybe one-fifth that in our burnt sienna. We still want it to be cohesive with what else we've built here. We'll use a hint of titanium white to desaturate it because Mars black and titanium white make a gray. And then we'll really double down on that black, adding about a third Mars black to our current mixture, maybe a little bit less but having to go back for more. And we're still not really dark enough. We do a little test up here. And that actually looks great. However, just to be safe, 
I'm going to make mine a bit warmer than what I see here. And if we want to, we can make it more green after. But I think this would be a great transition from what we have there and the value looks to be correct. That said, we're actually going to be applying this with a new brush. That next brush being the Filbert, and this is fantastic because it has a nice sharp top for rendering detail. It has rounded corners for blends, and as you can see, it can carry a fair amount of paint. Not as much as the one inch, but certainly more than the liner brush, and so it's great for rendering detail in the foreground when you still need to cover a relatively large area. As per usual, we'll begin by making sure that our brush is nice and damp. We'll head to our palette, grab some of that new pigment, and a lot of the initial markings are towards the top of the canvas that I notice as a prominent area for this. Now we have quite a bit of openings here, which I did intend to cover, and we are going to do that right now. I'm pressing the brush into the canvas very lightly and when the filbert brush is wet the bristles do tend to condense so when you make a tapping mark like that I get a number of smaller implications. It can be great for rendering tiny little leaves or clusters of them. Alternatively you can just block in the larger areas with this and then later on go back in with the liner brush and add in definitive foliage. That's something that I'm going to do regardless, just because it allots me additional control through this. But the general application here is a bit of a tap, occasionally a little bit of a drag if I want to elongate a specific section. And here, I'm actually going to go in towards the middle of this previously applied foliage and just make that a little bit darker. And then I'm going to expand outwards, as you can see. I'm rotating my brush in the air before my tap. That way I get a different marking each time. And it looks like the leaves are going in different directions. Sometimes I press a little bit harder if I want to fill in an area. Want to make it significantly more dense. And now we can see how that tree is starting to create a bit of a canopy effect. We have more of this towards the middle of this right here and this right here. By darkening the middle, we give it more depth, but we don't want to go too far down. We'll do a little bit here. But we don't want to go too far down because this is giving us that depth and it's showing that the subjects with this darker pigment are a bit closer to us in the foreground. So if we were to go here, it would imply that all of that's in the foreground, not something we want to do. That said, we can incorporate some new areas, just like this. Saw it in the reference photo and I thought, you know what, that's a really good spot for it. We can also create some foliage that doesn't necessarily connect to anything else up here. Just have that kind of dangling down. We'll have a lot on this side. And we'll have a couple areas that kind of flare up from. this right hand portion. And we essentially have foliage all the way to the bottom. So that's something we're going to do a lot of right here. Go in and we're not necessarily connecting it to these other areas. We're essentially placing it on top of those other areas. And we're bringing it in just a little bit we can use our one inch to cover this area once we're a bit farther along in the process. And 
There we go. Nice and easy. Put that brush down. Grab the one inch, make sure it's nice and damp. And I don't really have much paint left here on my palette, so we'll mix up some more. Again, it's very yellow ochre dominant. A little bit of titanium white. And we can even make it a little bit darker as we move towards this side. So I'll use slightly more Mars Black as we're moving more and more into an area that won't receive light. And as I apply this, I'm working my brush in an X-shaped pattern because it moves paint not only from the left to the right, but also up and down. So horizontally and vertically, it's the most efficient way to move paint as you kind of work against the clock and having it all dry. As I move towards the right, again, adding more Mars Black, making it darker. Trying to do so without having my hand in the way. So you can see everything quite well. There we are. And I do want light showing through, but I think that's something we add a little bit later in the process. We can use the sharper corner to dictate some of the edging a little bit better. And I'm just going to bring it so it wraps around like this. And we look for those larger sweeping motions as it'll just make it make a lot more sense. We're going to have a lot of trees over top of this, a lot of warm highlights on said trees. So that's going to look like some relatively boring negative space for just a little while. It's okay, don't worry about it. Uh, but with that, what we now need to do is head down towards the bottom and start getting in some of these reflections. So now we'll head down to the bottom, use that filbert brush and we really don't have that much space to cover, so I am feeling fairly confident that we don't have to go to the one inch. I'll just kind of work around my edges, which is typically what I like to do. And on this edge, we rotate our brush. We go back and forth so that we get different markings and indentations. Then we'll take all of that excess pigment from the top, bottom, left, and right, and like with the one inch, work it together with the X shape pattern. This is all dry, which is why they look like a different value, different color at this point. Once that dries, it will look very similar to that, but so far so good. And I think I'm going to mirror another one of our pieces of foliage with this actually because eventually I want this bottom area as a whole to be quite a bit darker. But we can work on that as we continue the piece in a later step. Hey there, little intermission here. I just wanted to remind you that if you haven't already, ensure that you have something to hydrate yourself and maybe a little snack on hand. I know that as we get into these painting processes, I personally can forget to eat, forget to drink, and as a result, my hands get quite shaky. That's not great when we're trying to render very finite applications and lines and we are about to move into the trees. So if you've been watching this video for a while or if you've been painting for a while, make sure that you do kind of ensure that you're healthy through the process, that you are remembering to do those things because it will have an impact on your painting. I know that it certainly does for me. And if your hands are still a little shaky, take your pinky finger, rest it on a dry area of canvas, and that should also help in the upcoming processes. But I'd also like to note in regards to drawing the trees and all of that, I will have the traceable up over on Patreon, along with the reference photo for color matching. It's essentially what we've been doing throughout this lesson in that I 
print out that reference photo and then I take that paint, those mixes, I go directly on it to ensure that I'm going in the right direction. But also if you are new to the channel up over on Patreon, you can also get access to all of my eBooks, which include acrylics for beginners, which is essentially the essentials, everything you need to know about acrylic painting before you jump into your first acrylic painting. We have access to an exclusive Facebook group where everybody gets to kind of share their work, help each other out. It's a really positive, supportive community. And you get to see different renditions of these lessons, ask questions about how other people are going about it. It's it's really cool. I'm really proud of what we've built up there. And I'd also just like to say a big thank you to everybody who does already support the channel up over on Patreon. This channel is predominantly community funded, and it's because of you that we're able to make lessons like this. So Big thank you to everybody. And again, a big reminder going into the next steps, if you aren't hydrated and if you don't have a little snack, make sure that you become so and have that because it will make a difference. And I think you'll be a lot happier with your end results. But anyway, that is the intermission. So let's jump back in and have some fun. Next, we're going to start working on the trees that we have right through here. We, of course, did the very subtle ones that we have in the real distance, but we're going to start moving forward and we're going to do so by taking those initial pigments, making them a little bit darker, but not substantially so. So this will actually be fairly similar to what we have here. We'll grab that burnt sienna about half that in our yellow ochre, by the way. I have the liner brush right now. We'll grab a little bit of our titanium white, about an equal amount to our yellow ochre. And we'll grab a hint of our Mars black, taking off the excess as we do, because we want to desaturate it, but we don't want it to become incredibly dark quickly. And then we'll just slowly add that until we get something we really like. I think we'll do a test with this. It's not bad, but I do want something a little bit brighter for the distance and I want something a little bit darker for that next step. So let's take this, let's grab more titanium white, move that over to the side, and we'll make two mixes out of it. So here we can have our brighter mix for the distance, so that's perfect. And we'll make that one darker by taking off the excess titanium white, grabbing some excess Mars black, working that into the other side. We'll probably need to saturate it a little bit more just because it lost its warmth. And now we'll go in for a test here, and that's also perfect. So that is what we'll begin with, and then we'll slowly transition into that right there. So let's make sure that our liner brush is nice, clean, and slightly damp. We'll grab that brighter pigment that we ended up mixing, and we'll head over to our trees. Now, something I would suggest is starting towards the top of one of these, applying as little pressure as possible. As you come down, slight, slightly add more to make it larger. And then we're going to skip a little bit of an area. We're going to come down here, and then we're just going to mirror it and let it kind of fade off into the reflection. But we definitely want that continued stroke, that continued feeling. We'll also create some smaller branches. This is very watery, so not super noticeable on the first pass, but that's okay. Water can be a great thing in that it thins your pigments so that they apply much more easily. It can condense your bristles so that your brush can make sharper markings, but if you apply too much, it can make it difficult to see the actual markings that you're making, right? So it's all about a balance. If you can find that balance, you can have a lot of control in your work. That said, let's take this and let's move over to the other side. Again, applying more pressure towards the bottom and now I'm relieving pressure as we move back up towards the top. Smaller branches on both sides. Mirroring images. 
Now let's blend that slightly, half and a half, with our darker pigment. So we have a natural transition here. And we can start crafting additional trees. I'm going to go over this bottom area a couple of times just because I didn't feel like it was really thick enough. There we go. And I'm going to deviate slightly from the reference photo just because I don't want it to look too busy in the painting and we only have so much surface area to work with. But we essentially want to fill in this area through here with this pigment. Have that second tree move up. We of course need smaller branches to come out of what we're working with. And we are at that point past where this would go. You essentially want your branches to get small to the point where you can't really see them anymore. And it's implied that they're still there, they're just a lot tinier. And we have a lot of these branches overlapping each other. Again, taking some artistic liberties. But making sure that it all makes sense within the world that we are creating here. There we go. Going to go over this a couple of times. Now we'll start moving into the darker mix. As we do again, start to get closer to us. And at this point, we're definitely going to want to switch our brush, but also move you a little bit closer. Now we have our filbert brush, and we want this because again, it has a nice sharp top, but because again, it has just more area for paint. Now, I like the darker pigment that we have, but we need to go even darker. So I'm going to mix a pigment right beside it. And really what I want here is close to what we have in this, but a little bit warmer. So dark, but with extra burnt sienna. We are still interjecting a little bit of yellow ochre, but not much because we don't want it to look like a green. We want it to be more of what we have right here. And again, we can bounce back with the Mars black. We can desaturate with the titanium white if we feel the need. And with this, we can work on the base layer for some of the foreground trees. And I like to make my trees with multiple strokes, as you can see. It's not one elongated stroke, and that is very purposeful because you want all of those little divots and changes within the side of the tree. And we can work this back a little bit. We want it in the reflection, of course. And this is just for the bottom of these distant trees. You can see that I'm really running out of paint which is great because it makes the marks as I move back more subtle, but it definitely makes it more natural. We can also incorporate some over here on the side. You can see that's quite thin because I just have a little bit too much water in my mix and not enough paint on the brush. It's okay though. We can go over it with another layer. Now here I'll start crafting another tree to this side, and this one splits off, has a little piece that juts out this way, like that, it's unique. Wouldn't have thought to do that without the reference photo. And now we have this larger, darker area 
which is balancing all of the dark that we have on the left hand side which is nice though this definitely does need another layer with that we'll head to the other side that being the bottom and we'll continue to work this down as well filling in the currently open areas now we could go back and add more paint to this but realistically if we let it dry first We'll have a much easier time going about that, so that's what I'm going to do. That said, we'll move upwards and we can finish the top together while it's all wet so we get something consistent. So now, heading up to the top here, we have one area that works upwards, and then we have another second branch that kind of weaves its way around. And we'll be able to see that and differentiate that in a little bit when we start adding in our highlights and our mid values. But for now, we're just getting this first thin layer down. That way we know where everything is going. And we'll have a second branch right through there. I'm essentially just drawing right now with thin pigment. It's relatively easy to paint on top of or to just take off the canvas. There we go. But also, in this process, if I end up leaving some brush strokes, it's not necessarily a bad thing, as these are all fairly aesthetic. Now, while we do wait for that to dry to apply our next layer, we will grab some of that pigment with the same brush. We'll head over to the other side of our canvas, and we'll craft some similar trees. Now, this area is going to actually end up receiving a lot of light via highlight that comes in on the left hand side of these branches because again the light is coming from that left hand side of the painting but this is going to be some nice added detail that we will appreciate towards the end creating some smaller branches trying to hold my brush from far back. That way, again, I'm not too controlled or intentional with my stroke. There we go. All starting to come together. And we can create some smaller branches for this as well, though your liner brush will handle this with a greater degree of detail. So. You can also wait to do so. It all depends on your dry time here and your just general patience. Uh, with that, this is looking quite dry, so we'll grab a good amount of pigment, go back in, cover up these previous layers. It's going to look a little bit darker because you're not going to see the white canvas showing through. Instead, you'll see the darker mix showing through the current mix. There we go. As it dries and looks less reflective, we'll get a much better idea of the actual coloring. And we can't forget the bottom. Also use this opportunity to sharpen some lines. And again, there's a little piece that's going to work its way out there. Now, there is a little tree over on the left-hand side that I can see in the reference photo, but again, it's blocked by essentially a structure right here. I don't want to incorporate said structure in this. I want to keep it as natural as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my tree a little bit larger, but it's going to still go on that same general angle. There we go. Maybe it's a tree that's fallen to a point and another tree has caught it, or maybe it's simply a tree that for one reason or another started to grow on a very interesting trajectory. The worst thing you can do in your paintings of nature, often, is paint all of your trees directly straight up. Often, things will look a whole lot better 
when you do incorporate your angles and the jagged edgings, all of the different things that make it unique. This is obviously too large, so I'm just going to quickly mix about half and half burnt sienna and yellow ochre, a little bit of Mars black, good amount of titanium white, probably equal to that of, say, the burnt sienna. And I'm just going to cover this area of the branch. Needs to be a bit warmer. We'll add burnt sienna to our mix. There we go. That looks like it fits within the rest of the piece and we can just tap that in elsewhere to make sure that it definitely does. And we can go back once that's dry and add in some extra detail, but when there's as much paint on the canvas as there is right now, it's really difficult to work with, so it's not the opportune time to do so, but we can come back to that. Now, while I wait for all of that to dry, I'm going to personally do a couple of touch-ups. Yours may differ, but I think the idea remains the same for all of us, and it's something that you want to think about throughout the entirety of the piece. So, in our next step, we're going to be applying branches, and that's going to cover a lot of this background foliage. So if we want to add more of this warmer, very sun-soaked foliage, now is the time to do so. It's also a good time to take some out. So that might mean taking this brighter pigment and working it over this warmer pigment, or alternatively, taking more of, again, about half and half, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, Titanium white, equal amount, hint of Mars black, not much. Might mean taking this, remixing that color very close, need a little bit more titanium white. There we go, that should be it, and that's perfect. And just filling in other portions. Now, a portion I really did want to fill in was this down here to a point. Notice that it is more open in the reference photo, however, we have a lot of light down here, and I don't want it to distract from the light that we have right through there. So, to kind of ensure that our eye goes where we want it to, I'm going to make some fairly straight marks down the edge of this tree, and then I'll work my way in in the similar way to how we painted that foliage. I'm going to start with more openings than I'm probably going to want in the end, but it's just going to allow me to progressively add them how I'd like. And we can paint that in between and around the darker foliage that we previously had. This is something I recommend adding, but it's not something you have to add. Again, I'm adding it because I feel like it's just going to end up being too distracting in the end. And the longer we wait to get rid of it, or to cover this area, the harder it's going to become. That said, it doesn't have to be done. And if you feel like you've actually added too much and you want more of that brightness, now is also very much the time. So, it's not taking long. We'll have the ground covering a lot of it here. There we go, like that, like that a lot, and it should be good. I'll add just a little bit up to the top because it too rivals what we have going down here. I think we'll be okay because we're going to add a lot of detail in this area, a lot of detail in this area. We're just not there yet, so I'm not going to overdo this area. As we can do this later on, it's just easier to do so right now. So I'm getting in the areas that I know I want to. There we are. And this should be dry, so now we can start working on our next step. So we'll start endeavoring into our branches with these smaller ones that we can see in the background. And as you can tell, they're not quite as dark as what we have in the foreground. It's more of a middle ground value, something similar to that of 
the actual foliage. And so we'll make this by grabbing our warmest pigment, of course, that being the burnt sienna, and we'll mix it right here. We'll grab about half that in our yellow ochre. We'll grab about a similar amount, actually, of the burnt sienna in titanium white. And then we'll also grab a hint of our Mars black, and I do mean just a hint. So we'll mix that up. It should give us something relatively desaturated. I do think it's not, not warm enough yet. So I'll go back for more burnt sienna. Go in, do a little test. It's good. Could be darker. Another hint of Mars black. Again, we take it slow. That looks really nice, and that is fantastic. So we'll head back in with this and start adding in some detail. Though the real detail, the real branches, will happen when we start working with all of that. So we'll continue to use that liner brush that we've been working with. I'll find that larger cluster of foliage, and we'll start with a smaller marking as we move off of it, slowly apply more pressure and create that larger stroke that leads into the tree because as we move farther up and away from that base of the tree, all of our markings should progressively get smaller and smaller. And that rule exists within our branches as well as we continue to weave these in and out of our foliage. You can see that it's happening on both sides of the larger tree here. I start with the ones that I feel like need to be the most prominent. And then we also work in smaller ones after that. Almost like complementary little branches. Branches that don't necessarily deviate how the eye is moving, but make the piece as a whole feel more realistic because of their inclusion. And that's something to consider because if a branch is large, it's going to be a leading line and it's going to direct the eye. But because there are so many branches, eventually the smaller ones aren't going to have that same effect. They are just going to help accent the piece. A lot of these are working very similarly, so I want to deviate from that. I'll have one that works behind and through. Remember that they don't just work all horizontally, that a lot of them are also overlapping one another. Here I'm making something slightly darker. And you can also play with their depth by making them darker occasionally. Like that. You can have them kind of go in between our trees. Something I'm still trying to flesh out is this middle portion, trying to have them overlap more so horizontally rather than just going up on that same angle. This is quite transparent because I have a good amount of water in it, but it's allowing me to make some more dramatic markings without fully committing to them or having a massive impact, which is appreciated at this stage. And here we can have some smaller branches yet again. There we go. That's really natural. Something else you don't want is a lot of branches that are very softly curved. Having hard lines and hard breaks really will make your branches look a whole lot better. You can also go back and add foliage on top if you feel like there's too many. So it's fairly forgiving. There we go. 
Now for a really fun part, working on the highlights on the trees to the right hand side here. As you can see, it has a lot of warm light. We'll start our mix with our yellow ochre. This is fully dry, so I'll just mix on top of this. I think I'm gonna go with an equal mixture of our burnt sienna and an equal mixture of our titanium white. We'll need a small amount of Mars Black, but it's important to recognize that we are not placing this pigment on top of a white canvas. We're placing it on top of an almost black. Now, almost all acrylic paint is semi-transparent, so we will see through this to a point. So this won't actually be as bright on the canvas as it is right here on our palette. Now, we can do a little test over here and we can see that it's really close. It could be a little bit brighter, but I'm not going to add that brightness right now. We're going to apply this, and then if we want, in a, another layer, once this first one dries, we can add that brighter layer. That way we're building a bright layer on top of a fairly bright layer, rather than a singular brighter layer on top of a darker layer. It'll just look a lot more professional and we'll get much more natural color that we have on our palette. It'll also just give us more room to play. Now we want to do this from a bit of a distance, that way we can see the reflection and the tree at the same time. I'm going to go in from the top here and I'm going to make a very thin marking applying sometimes less and sometimes more pressure, that way I get a change in the transparency as well as the sizing. Something else you'll see me do is I use my pinky finger to rest on the canvas to eliminate shake from my hand. We'll go in and we'll do another one. It's very watery, just like that. We of course need our proper reflections. There we go. Now, I'm not going to start at the bottom. I'm yet again going to go towards the top and I'm slowly still angling things down into about this center area right here. But as I move towards the right hand side, things start to get slightly more vertical, where initially they had a bit more of a bend out. And I'll do another one with quite a bend over here, and it'll actually, instead of going towards the bottom, it's going to go behind some of our others. And I'll go over the edge a couple of times on a number of these to further distinguish them. We can also create a second area where the tree can come down to, right about here. So now we have two, the, I said the tree, multiple trees. <laughs> and. I think I want a third area. I'm looking over the reference photo. There should be a third area right over here where lots of smaller markings kind of come in together. Again, we want our reflections. There we go. Starting, starting to come together. We have another one that kind of leans out this way. Yet again, I'm going to go over some of the more prominent areas and I'm slowly just building it up. My mixture is still quite watery. So these layers are required and it's just watery so that I can get a very small marking when I want, but also so that I don't commit a massive amount of pigment at any given time. There we go. And over here, we have a couple more. 
We'll have that kind of get lost behind this one, I think. There we go. We are going to flesh these out, make them look a lot more three-dimensional, but that'll come in time. I'm also going to start creating some branches for the tops of these. And we have a, a larger tree right here. There we go. Again, it's quite the process. Once we have the majority of these where we want them to be, we can get closer and start crafting them into actual trees rather than just elongated lines. We are getting there soon. Okay. Let's get closer. Now, we essentially just worked on the left-hand side of all of these tree branches, and now we're going to work this way. So we're getting farther away from the light. We're going to make this mixture a little bit warmer, a little bit more brown anyway, and we're going to add a hint of Mars Black to it. You can see that I'm mixing on top of our previous mixture, but I'm leaving quite a bit of that previous mixture up so I can return to it and that mix when I want to. And I'm just going to work this on the right hand side of our previous applications. Just like this. It's going to overlap the highlight just a little bit. I'm okay with that. We are going back to the highlighted sides anyway. This just ensures we do so. We don't get lazy with it. Grabbing more paint. There we go. It's all going to come together. You can see when we're close up just how watery it is. It doesn't have to be so, but again, it's just a very safe way to work with the initial layering. And this should definitely be larger. We can start to do a little bit of a blend. I'm going to grab some of that highlight and just fix up previous portions that could use it, as well as re-instigate some of these edges. As you can see, making multiple little strokes rather than larger elongated ones. Building up those highlights yet again. Now let's grab extra titanium white, work that into our highlight mixture, and now we can work this in there as well. Here I'll combine these two areas to be a singular tree. We'll have another one right through here. And I'm not getting all of the edges. I want some to be a little bit brighter, some to be a little bit darker. That way it looks like the tree has divots. And I'm not going to do much over here on the right hand side as we want to keep this respecting the light sources in the piece. That said, I will throw on a couple branches. Like so. And now I think we need a bit of a darker backing. We'll make this area bigger. And you can see we're just building these trees up from an individual line into something a lot more three-dimensional, has a lot more color in it, a lot more thick, 
than the initial application. We don't want too much at the top just because we have foliage blocking a lot of those areas but we can still have hints of branches and whatnot. We're also going to want to make sure that we copy all of this down towards the bottom of the painting as well. There we go. We can also go back to more of a Mars black, burnt sienna, a little bit of ochre, a little bit of titanium white. We can go back to these darker mixtures and separate portions of our trees or clean them up if we want to. Give them a sharper edge or as you can see here, work this in between. We'll grab this right here. And you know what, let's work this over top of this tree. Let's put that in the distance. Separating these and these, creating more individual entities. Good. Making sure that the trees get smaller as they work their way up. Now, I realized I was a little too close to the canvas, and I was getting hyper fixated on the individual little pieces rather than stepping back and looking at them as the larger subject and cluster that they are. So I took those steps back, I did a little bit of reworking, and I let it all dry, which is important because I want to go in and add some real highlights, but there was so much paint on there that was wet, it was just too difficult to add in additional brighter layers without it just being very diluted. So let that dry entirely, took those steps back, and now we're going to jump back in. But if you find yourself just kind of getting lost within it, take a little break, let it dry. You'll see it a lot more clearly often when paint is wet, uh, especially very specific portions. It's a little difficult to read and it's not going to look as good as it does when it's dry and you know all has the same finish. So a little tip there. But heading back to our palette, I'm going to grab a little bit of our burnt sienna, equal amount of our yellow ochre, about five times that titanium white. And we'll make a really nice bright pigment, not quite as bright as what we have there, but certainly a lot brighter than what we currently have for our trees. We need to recognize that this pigment is going to be darker on the canvas because we're applying it over a darker area, but I'm going to apply this to the edge of the most prominent trees the larger ones that you can see that light wrapping around to a greater degree. I'm just going to make a bit more, just like so. Come back in. There we are. Now we have a lot of light on these branches in these areas really making this stand out, these two pieces specifically, rather than having all of these trees and branches essentially looking the same and just getting lost together, looking a little messy now. Now we have some prominent ones. And we essentially are going to have some trees brighter than others in this longer line of them. And you know what, I'll, I'll do another one right, right through here just to show you what I mean. We're going to have them be like that and inconsistently so because the light is coming from this side and these trees are going to block these to a point but they're also going to be openings and here, here we have an opening. So I'm just going through doing multiple layers, building it up and creating a nice distinctive point. There we are. We can add a little bit of it to our reflection. 
but not too, too much because we want our reflection to be a lot darker. There we are. Nice and subtle down there. So now, so that this doesn't look out of place, we're going to head over to this side and we'll do so with a darker mixture than what we were just working with because we want something that we can build up with, right? Now I do want it to be somewhat gray, so we do need a hint of our Mars black in there. We can do a little test over on the less bright areas on this side. I like that. Cleaning off the brush, that way we don't have too much excess. Coming back over here, going to the left hand side, and I we'll start applying our pigment. That said, these trees don't have as much movement and as many trees as what we have over here. So we can move in closer and not worry too much about staying at a distance for a larger portion. So let's get you a bit closer. Here we are, a bit closer, still using that liner brush, still working with that same mix. I'm going to go over a couple of those previous applications and I'm going to work on some more linear bark, essentially. So bark that's raised out of the tree and substantially so. It's always interesting because all of the divots create miniature leading lines. It's very easily accomplishable detail. I like it a lot and you can have some that are brighter than others, protruding areas that is because they're not all going to protrude to the same height and they're not all going to catch the same amount of light. What we're doing here is essentially painting the areas of bark that are the farthest out and the darker areas, the divots, little fissures, are the inset areas. Again, always important to remember that we shouldn't just paint, sorry, focusing there. <laughs> we shouldn't just paint thinking about uh, how to accomplish something. We, we think about why we're accomplishing it. We think about what makes it that way. That way we can take those ideas into future paintings and elements. Allowing it to dissipate as we move towards the right hand side. I'm applying less pressure as we get towards this right hand side of the tree as well. That way it gets softer and softer. We're still getting that texture in, but it's not as prominent. And I'm taking some artistic liberties from the reference photo yet again, making it a bit more my own. Just because I only have so much canvas to work with. And it's important to recognize how much canvas you have because you can only physically fit so much detail. That's why a lot of realistic landscape painting has the implication of subjects rather than the actual subject. It just looks more real, more natural when we paint the general aesthetic, the idea of it, rather than it itself in totality. Having this tree wind up into here, we will be repainting foliage over these trees. So if there's an area that you don't love, we can cover it up, but also it'll make it look a lot more three-dimensional later on. So if you feel like it's missing that, we are going to have an opportunity to interject that. Lots of focusing. Again, I apologize if I'm at some point here a little quiet or if my explanations are a little slow. And 
in the reference photo, the tree kind of breaks off into two areas here, and I, I like it a lot, actually. So I'm going to do that. It's not going to be anything too noticeable or too prominent, but it's just a nice little feature. This one you can see kind of wraps this way, there's one that wraps behind, and it's just the tree splitting into two different areas. Heading back down, going over previously applied spots. This will also get that same treatment, however it'll be on the top. And we'll need to paint the reflection. And we'll also paint the reflection of this, but we'll let it dissipate quickly. And we won't do as much or spend as much time because it should be a lot darker. There we go. Now let's brighten up portions in here. A bit more titanium white and a bit more yellow ochre. Just looking at my photo. I'm going to go over previously established spots, areas that are raised. This is quite bright in relation to what we just had. You can work middle steps in there, and we can actually go back and reincorporate middle steps, which is probably what I'll end up doing. There we go, that stands out a little bit better now. It's a bit more distinct. Its own area of tree that doesn't get lost in the background, which is sometimes what we want, but these trees are in the foreground, so not so much here. Use a little bit of this on here, on here, and down here. Not much though. Okay, now let's go with a bit more of an orange mixture. Some more burnt sienna. This will darken it because burnt sienna is darker than the mix that we had on our palette. And we can work this in behind a lot of those highlights, kind of in that middle area before the tree gets to the darker side, but not necessarily on the true left-hand side where we have our more yellow highlights. And the oranges and the yellows will tie it all back into the background. Make it look really nice. Starting to make markings that are too large because I don't have enough water on my brush. That said, we can definitely craft this into something. Tie it in to the rest of the tree. There we go. Lots of little layers. Lots of little applications. I like that a lot. Going through, and I'll also throw this on some of our distant trees. We have highlights on the back of those. Should probably have them on the backs of a couple of these visible ones. And we can incorporate that into these as well. So at this point, I like a lot of our branches and our trees. I'm confident enough that this area is going to stay as it is. So what I want to do is actually take some of our titanium white 
a little bit of our cadmium yellow, maybe a hint of our burnt sienna. Just create a warmer sky color similar to what we have up here with a hint of extra warmth. And then I'm going to find little areas in between branches that I can place openings. And I can see quite a few in the reference photo, but I am just also working it along with my painting, what I feel it needs. I'm going to take a couple of steps back. I can already tell I've done a lot in relation to what I want to do. So I'm not going to do too much more. But it definitely gives this area a lot more dimension. And I like that. significantly more three-dimensional and you can also work this in any other area. Any area you apply this, you're obviously noting that the warmer foliage isn't behind it, so it is a, a true opening towards the background. But that's not a bad thing. Just something to be aware of if you already have that orange in a certain area. There we go. Okay, that is looking good. Something else while we're here at this distance. I'd like to do a little bit more foliage in the foreground. And remember, as it gets closer to us, we lose a lot of that reflective atmospheric light. And all of what's closer is going to A, be a bit darker, B, be a bit more of its innate coloring. So I'm going to go in with a lot of Mars black because we are far away from that light. We're not going to use much titanium white, but we are going to use some, maybe one, two tenths. There we go. And then we're not going to use much of our burnt sienna. We're actually going to use quite a bit of our yellow. This is going to offer us a fairly green mixture and something we can tap over our trees. Remember, we need to ensure that this is three-dimensional, that our foliage does, in fact, work not only beside, but in front of and behind the trees that we're rendering. And now that we've rendered them, we can go back and efficiently cover up portions as well as work this around to a greater degree than we were previously. Here I'm trying to connect the two sides a little bit more. That can be done up here as well. I can see on the photo a large area right here is covered by foliage and I actually like that a lot. I like separating, rather the idea of separating these to a point, at least visually. So going in with a little tap and that liner brush, it's going to make these areas be a bit more mysterious. Right now they're fairly straightforward. Majority of this is going to blend into the background, but not all of it. And what's left will be really nice. There we go. And a lot of this is happening at this area. You can see we have this lower part but we also want some to be higher to balance it. We don't have a lot of bright wood up here, but we do have a little bit that we can cover and just diversify to a greater degree. I 
it's also one of those layers that will look a lot better as it dries. So I'd go with a slightly less is more approach, let it dry, give it a good look, and then decide if you want to do more or if you're happy with it from there. Here now I'm bouncing back over to this side as it started to dry. and I have a better look of what it actually looks like. There we are. I think I'm quite happy with that for now. So let's start heading in to this area. Now we'll head back to our one inch flat headed brush, make sure that it's nice and damp. Then we'll grab a good amount here of Mars Black and we'll grab about half that in yellow ochre, hint of titanium white, and this is what we're going to use essentially to block in the base layer of our grass. This is going to be on both sides and I'm just going to very loosely work up with my brush relieving pressure as I do. I'm just looking for that slight inconsistent set of markings from the bristles. Then we'll head over to the other side. We'll do the same thing. Doesn't have to be exactly the same in terms of how high this is because realistically it's just more land and there are divots and higher planes. We just want it to be approximately across. Then Grab a bit more of that pigment. We are going to have a reflection of that grass right down here. Yes, we are covering a bit of our painting, but that's okay. Again, when I paint, I like to make my underlayers a little bit larger than I think they're going to need to be. That way I can cover them up and just have more room and opportunity to do so. Okay, now those are slightly green. They're very, very dark, so you don't really notice it, but we're going to make a warmer mixture. So a lot of our burnt sienna, but double what we were using of our yellow ochre in this mix. It still has a little bit of yellow ochre, so it'll be cohesive but I'm also doubling up the Mars Black in this. And for this one, this will be our land. We'll work that all the way across. We will build our highlights and our textures on top of this after it dries, but for now, it's just a very simple initial layer. Nothing too tricky. There we are. You know what, we'll move that down a little bit. It's quite thin, so you may have to do a couple layers, depending upon how much water you use. There we go. That's nice. Let that dry, do a second layer probably. Third layer, come back. And then at that point, we can apply some actual grass and some of the nice ground textures. Now I'm going to be grabbing some sap green for my mixture. And I like this because it's a very natural green. It's not too saturated, but it should do the trick and we can make it warmer with our pre-established colors. In addition to the sap green, we'll also be going back to our one third inch filbert brush, which I will make nice and damp. We will grab our noon green pigment, move that over here. We'll go for about a third of that in Mars black, about a third of that in titanium white. This will desaturate it, Mars black and titanium white. 
And then we want to make it a little bit more akin to the pigments we have in here. So we'll add a third of our yellow ochre. And that right there is a really nice color. I'm not going for exactly what we have in the reference photo. I feel like that's very saturated and I want something that's a bit more subtle. And I think this will be a great base for it. From there, I'm going to start by working my brush up. And because of the filbert brush, when wet, the bristles will separate just a little bit and I'll get the impression of grass. Very, very simply, I'm leaving slight openings in between different strokes. That way we have little divots and areas that look a bit more sunken in and just have slightly less grass. Actually, I'll move you a little bit closer. So we'll continue this over here. I'm going to start from the bottom of where the grass is. And then I move up and as you can see, I relieve pressure as I come towards the top. I'm skipping little areas in between to create some depth and that way we can actually see the markings we're making here. not pressing too hard at any given point. You can also define the sharp tops with a liner brush after if you want more of a distinct look. There we go. That's pretty prominent. We want a good reflection of them as well. Reflections going to be a little bit more loose. I might fill it in slightly more. That way it is a bit more distinctive. There we go. And let's take another step back. So here we are with it now dry to the touch. I'm going to still use that Filbert brush, make sure it's nice and damp. We'll mix up a brighter green than what we did previously. So where we did an even mixture of titanium white and Mars black last time, I'm going to go with about a third that Mars black to our titanium white. Still using the same amount of our yellow ochre. And I like that green a lot but I have too much pigment on my brush, condensing my bristles, so I'm going to make that nice and damp, take that extra paint off. We'll grab some pigment. Light's coming this way, so we know this side should definitively be fairly bright. You'll find with some brushes, it'll work better if you work from the bottom upwards and some it'll work better if you work from the top down. Just give it a little try. You can do so on an extra canvas or on an area here that you feel you might cover up. But here with me and this brush right now, it's definitely working better working upwards. That said, definitely need more water, more pigment. We'll start going over here. And it's also worth noting that what I'm doing right now isn't that bright or distinct. It's just a little bit more so than what we were previously working with. And again, I'm a bit looser with the reflection as I have been through the rest of the painting. The grass is all leaning slightly this way on both sides and that shows that there's a little bit of wind moving that way. When you paint grass, it is something you want to think about. Is it a windy scene? Is it a scene completely without wind? Because that will dictate how your grass moves and your grass can act as a great leading line. I'm purposefully moving the grass in the direction that I am. 
because we have a lot of light on the left hand side here and I want to push the eye towards the center of the painting. So I'm doing so in small ways like that of how we manipulate our grass. And I'm just going over it a number of times, building up those layers until we have something nice and natural. I think I'm going to let that dry before I do any more. And in the meantime, we'll put that brush down. We'll pick back up our liner brush, grab some of that burnt sienna, about half that yellow ochre, about half that titanium white, one fifth that Mars black. We're looking for a medium, essentially a mid value of our warmer pigment. And then we're going to go in with taps to create our ground, I'm leaving lots of little openings in between my taps. That way it looks like there are a myriad of little raised portions. This is all right under our grass, might slightly overlap it a little bit. Letting my brush run out of paint as you move towards the left hand side here just because I don't want to bring the eye that way to too great of a degree as we were just mentioning with the grass. We are looking for little ways like that to keep attention in specific portions of the painting. That same idea is going to work over here towards the right. However, I might do slightly more towards the right to balance the light that we have on the left hand side. Yeah, I like that. And of course there is a reflection of it. So we'll work a bit more loosely. There's a bit more of a drag. There's a bit of a darker area in between the reflection and the actual land. There we go. So far nice and subtle. Let's brighten it up a little bit. Double up the titanium white, head to the top mid, going back in and I know, I know you're very far away, <laughs> camera wise, while we're painting detail, and that seems unintuitive, but it is intentional because this is something where if you can, you paint it from far away because you want to see this and the values in relation to everything else and ensure that, again, we're moving the eye and keeping the eye where we want to, right? It's a really big part of it as we come towards final steps when a lot of subjects are rendered and we are incorporating a new one that is expected to fit in with everything else successfully. So we do this from afar, you can see I'm now holding my brush farther back to aid me in this process. It's making it harder to apply intentional strokes, but that is a trade we happily make here. Do a little bit more of the reflection, there we go, awesome. Really, really nice. Also, again, you can use this brush. Green, yellow, white, a little bit of black. Create individual strands for your grass, should you want to. This is all very minor. 
but if you want just a touch of a highlight somewhere or to make an area more distinctive, it's very easily achievable. Now what we're going to do is darken the base of our reflection predominantly here at the bottom. I don't want to hinder the reflection of the actual light, but I would like to darken this and add a little bit of movement to the water. I'm going to do so with the one inch flat headed brush. I'm going to make sure it's nice and damp. I'm going to head back over to our palette. We'll grab some of our Mars black, move it to a clean spot on the palette, grab a hint, by a hint I mean probably a third of our burnt sienna, probably a fifth of our yellow ochre, and then I'm going to thin this to a good extent by grabbing extra water, working that on here until we get something that looks a bit more like watercolor. This is a wash, and this is generally intended to change the value or not to change, well, uh, it, it can do a couple of things. It can change the value, which is what we are intending to do here. It can change the hue, but typically what it doesn't intend to do is change the actual line work or the details. It's just essentially a filter. So I'm going to apply this to the bottom. As you can see, I'm going to work my way up working horizontal strokes. They're dissipating as I get towards the middle. Nice and simple. Let's go back, we'll grab more of that pigment. I'm going to apply it again to the bottom and work my way up a little bit. Now, I'm going to remix that darker color that we have there. And remember, it's in the foreground, so it's a bit more green, a bit more yellow ochre than our burnt sienna. It is just a remix of something we've done before, a hint of titanium white. Not much. And I'll do a couple little taps here. It's a similar color to our reflections of our tree branches here as well. And by moving them back and forth, we create that nice vignette effect. go. Ties the painting together a bit better, has nice motion. Note so this is actually water to a greater degree. Then, then, put that brush down, head back to our liner brush, Look at some of those nice oranges that we have, or more, more so warm yellows. We'll recreate those. So equal mixture of our burnt sienna, our yellow, good amount of white, very small amount of black. And we're doing that same thing. We just move it back and forth. Again, not in the reference photo, but we'll make our water a bit more distinct. There we go. Starting to get really nice. This is another part of the painting where you're probably going to want to paint, holding your brush a little bit farther back. You 
can see how we're now moving all of our colors into each other. Disrupting the initial line work. Let's get you a little bit closer. So, now, I like this a lot, but I think it could be a little bit brighter in the middle, build some dimension on that. So I'll add in extra titanium white. We'll go back and I'm aiming for the center, that way it dissipates towards the edges, it gets a little bit darker, a bit more orange. And this will be good to kind of work closer to the center area, right? There we go. Yet again, let's add more white, being careful in my mix to not grab any of the green. That is semi-present. We can even use our fingers. Don't know that we've done any finger painting in this yet, but as I try to note in so many of my lessons, I am a fan. Never grew out of it. Always find it useful. The hand is a fantastic tool. There we are. You can make this look really clean if you want to. You can make it look a little messy if you want to. There isn't really a right or wrong way of going about it. It's all about the aesthetic that you want to create. Really like this. We almost have a little bit of a gray, and grays very much heighten the other pigments around them, make them more notable. Here we are, just moving over previous subjects. We'll do a hint of it over here. And this is just to balance out, again, more of those light pigments on the top over there. Having this stark contrast of the light and the dark, really useful in that scenario. Let's go back to those darker pigments. Moving in the general directions that we were doing previously. Don't want to overdo it, but we can always work backwards. I think I want more of our orange, but not our hyper bright orange. Hint of Mars black in that. There we go. Yeah, I like that. It's nice. Give it kind of a golden glow running off. Everybody's painting is going to look a little different through this section if you decide to add this effect. And you can come up with some really neat things. Now at this point we get to endeavor into one of my favorite portions of any painting. That is that final 5% where we look for little areas that we feel could be touched up, could be a little bit better and we focus on them. For me, I think that the grass could be a bit warmer and it could be, it could have more distinct line work. So I'm going back to the liner brush. We will grab some of our yellow ochre to begin with this time. 
We'll go about a third of that with our sap green, so it's very yellow dominant. Grab a hint of our titanium white and our Mars black, won't need much of either. And we'll go in and see if this is bright enough. I like the color, as you can probably tell even from the distance, it definitely matches the rest of the painting better. However, I do feel it's a little bit dark. Now I'm still applying it because I like layering and I like building colors up over time. I think that often it gives us a, a really nice look, but we do need more titanium white. So we'll throw that in there. We'll resaturate it just a hair. And we'll jump back in. Speaking of hair, by the way, all of the brushes I use in all of these lessons are synthetic. I much prefer synthetic brushes, especially for acrylic painting. Get that question once in a while. This is much better. This is really nice. Getting some distinct lines because of the damp brush and we're getting the color we really want. Going to head down and ensure that our reflection also mirrors that. And as we get towards the end of the painting, I always like to give a little code word, something you can use in the comments section as a subtle little badge of honor for getting towards the end. Often only 13% of people make it to the end of these, so if you are one of those dedicated few, you can leave the word mirror or mirrored in the comments or work it into a sentence, but it'll just be a very fun subtle way for me to see and for everybody else to see who's gotten this far that you too Again, we're very dedicated to the lesson, and I'm sure that if you did make it this far, you're gonna do a great job. Hope you feel like over the course of the lesson, you picked up a lot of information, that you feel excited and ready to go and start your painting, or if you've been painting along with me here, that it's turning out quite nice. Something you can be really proud of. Always love to see people happy and full of energy when they finish these. But with that, again, also big, big thank you to everybody up over on Patreon for keeping the lights on and making this and all of the other lessons happen. Could not do it without you and your support. If you are new to the channel, you can get the, again, the traceable and the reference photo up there, all in one tidy place, along with the material lists, all of my eBooks, including Acrylics for Beginners, which again is essentially the essentials, everything you need to know about acrylic painting, and access to our exclusive Facebook group. Taking this color and I'm working it horizontally just a little bit to splash it elsewhere in the lesson, in the painting. Oh, that was a, that was a good little line. It was a small one, but it worked really well. Um, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I like the larger arch. You can see that over time we kind of filled that in so that it did get the entirety of the top. I like our little openings. You know what, we could do a couple more little openings. Just grab some titanium white, a little bit of that yellow ochre, a little bit of that burnt sienna, but predominantly titanium white. Let's work a couple more of these in going over previous ones just in case they weren't thick enough. 
upon first application. And of course, we're working these in a lot of different spaces. There we go. We can also take that same pigment and add to the base. Love the light that we've kind of generated down here. And again, this just came out of a, an idea and an artistic liberty. So don't be afraid to take chances, make pieces your own. These lessons are meant to help guide you, teach you things, but they are not meant to handcuff you to certain ideas. So if there's a certain style that you love working with, if you want to take the painting in a different direction, if you simply don't agree with something I've said and you feel like you would like to do it a different way, by all means, please feel free to do that. Art is expressive, it is subjective, it is so many of these great things that make it individual even when we're following the same reference photo, even when we're following the same lesson please feel free to take those artistic liberties. Please feel free to copy it exactly. It's really your process, your journey, and you can approach it how you'd like to. And I, I think that's one of the larger lessons I'd like to leave off here with. But again, as always, thank you for being here. I hope you had a great time. I will see you next weekend with another new lesson. So if you haven't already, subscribe. And yeah. Thank you, and above all, as always, stay creative.